Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. I hope that everyone out there had a great new year, and I hope that 2024 is a fantastic year for all of you guys out there. All right, today we have part two of the Bug and Maya story. Right, I want to thank you guys for being patient. It took a long time to get this video done, but I wanted to do it justice, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So I got a lot to cover, so let's get into this. When Ben's case against him for the death of Big Greeny Greenberg was dropped, Ben was released, and he went back to exploiting the City of Angels. In the 1930s, when Ben started living in L.A., he reunited with his childhood friend, the actor George Raft. Raft was born in a cold tenement in New York's Hell's Kitchen a few years before Ben. They met as teenagers and quickly became friends. Raft was a thief, just like Ben, and the two were still anything not bolted down. He even participated in Ben's favorite pastime, sitting on a rooftop, dropping bricks, milk bottles, flower pots, or whatever they could get their hands on, onto unsuspecting policemen walking the beat below. When Prohibition went into effect, George was sleeping in pool halls and the subway and stealing to get by. Sometimes he worked as a stand-in shooter for floating crap games. He would be at the games, and when the cops raided, he would take the dice for the shooter and take the gambling charge for five bucks. Soon he was under the wing of Oni Madden. Only controlled Hell's Kitchen. He owned a cotton club and he had some connections with the big wigs in Hollywood. Now, Raff was a good looking guy and he could dance. So Oni sent him out to LA to put him in the pictures. George would go on to make it big in Hollywood. He used his experiences in the streets of New York to craft the perfect image for the hottest new genre in film, the gangster flick. George would star in many of the classic gangster films in the 30s, including his role as Guino Ronaldo in the original Scarface movie in 1932. Ben's friendship with George was rekindled in L.A., and George took Ben to parties, and he rubbed shoulders with the biggest names in Hollywood. Soon, everyone wanted to hand some gangster at their parties. Ben would show up, have drinks, socialize, and play poker. He loved the attention, and they loved being in the presence of a real-life killer. But Ben was always on the hustle. He used his charm and, more importantly, his reputation to secure loans for many actors and studio owners, loans that were never paid back. Ben didn't offer to, and most people just didn't have the balls to ask for it back, and he knew that. Back in the spring of 1938, Ben was at the Santa Anita racetrack with George, and he was introduced to the Countess Dorothy DeFrasso, the wife of Italian Count Carlo Dentis DeFrasso. Dorothy was born in New York to well-do parents in 1888. She was a young socialite and partied amongst the wealthy. Around 1912, she married British aviator Claude Graham White. In 1916, Dorothy inherited $12 million from her father, and she divorced Claude Graham White the same year. In 1923, she met and married the Count. The two rarely spent time together, and by the 30s, she was living in Hollywood with the actress Mary Pickford. And she began a torrid love affair with the actor Gary Cooper. After Ben met the Countess, he returned to George's booth and George gave him the skinny on the Countess. Later that night, Ben was in the receiving line at a party hosted by the Countess. One evening in 1938, Ben and the Countess were in New York at a dingy nightclub slumming it. When an old man named Bill Balbear came in, Bill Balbear was known for carrying around a map drawn on an old tablecloth that he said led to a hidden pirate treasure worth $90 million in the Cocoa Islands off the coast of Costa Rica. He pulled the dingy tablecloth out and showed Ben and the Countess. A few days later, they chartered a vessel named the Metha Nelson, a 460-ton, three-mast schooner docked in L.A. Ben recruited some of his unsavory pals to be security in case they were attacked by pirates. Ben, the Countess, and 18 others including Bill Balbeer, his map, and Dr. Benjamin Blank, the official physician of the L.A. County Jail, set for the Cocoa Islands equipped with pickaxes, drills, shovels, and dynamite for blasting. When they arrived off the coast of Costa Rica, the Costa Rican army boarded the vessel packing Tommy guns. They told Ben that many Costa Ricans had torn the island up before for over 100 years looking for the treasure. But if they were successful, the country of Costa Rica wanted their 30% cut. When the party arrived at the island, they went ashore and began drilling and digging for 10 days around the clock through stifling heat, bugs, and tropical rainstorms. They dug through rocks and shale and blew up entire cliffs, all for nothing. After 10 days, a frustrated Ben told the captain to gather the crew and set sail for home. Ben got off in Panama and took a bus back to L.A., leaving the Countess and the crew behind. Lucky for him, though, because after he left, 
The ship was hit by a huge storm and was left floating in the hot sun after the engine failed. Eventually, they would be rescued by an Italian vessel that towed them to Acapulco. From there, the Countess took a flight back to L.A. When the ship finally made it back to L.A. a month later, the captain brought charges of mutiny against Ben for abandoning his responsibilities. A grand jury decided that no charges should be brought. Meanwhile, Meyer was using his many underworld connections to partner up with gangsters around the country to make money. He partnered with Frank Costello to open up a carpet house in Saratoga. These places, like I said, were classy joints. You come in, you get a fine dinner, be seated by a maid of D, and taken a performance by some of the best talent. Then go in the back and lose your shirt in a fair game. Maya's games were always fair. He believed that if word got out that his casinos were fixed, it would damage his reputation and his business. Along with his old pal, Long East Wilman, he opened up a casino in Bergen County, New Jersey, right across the Hudson. They catered to New York's elite and paid the authorities a healthy bribe weekly to keep it operating. He would open up Saratoga in the summer and in the spring he would bring a load of and in the spring he would bring a load of slot machines and set up an arcade at the Texas Centennial Exhibition yearly with his brother Jake. One of his ventures took him to Iowa. In 1941, he partnered with Bill Sims to run a Greyhound racing track. They would pay the city of Council Bluff, Iowa a thousand dollars weekly for five years to use an abandoned fairground for dog racing. The pair invested 20 grand, building and equipping the Dodge Park Kennel Club. In August of 1941, the state Supreme Court in Des Moines had the track shut down while the legality of the deal was weighed. So after greasing the right palms, they were cleared to operate. In September 1943, a woman named Mabel Bronda fell down 10 steps at the racetrack and she sued Meyer and his partner for having insufficient lighting and safety equipment. By May 1944, the races were halted. In the early 40s, Maya's old pal Frank Costello was seen as the biggest gangster in America. He had slot machines and carpet joints all over the country. He found that many small counties were eager to partner up with gangsters to make money off of gambling. He had carpet joints in Louisiana, upstate New York, New Jersey, and he had muscled in on gambling in Broward County, Florida, right outside of Miami. Walter Winchell, the gossip columnist, was hinting that he was going to do a story on Frank. And Frank called Meyer in for help. Meyer invited Walter Winchell to the casino and showed him a good time. He left with his pockets full and his opinion changed. Meyer and Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo joined Costello in Florida. Soon after they arrived, local competition began to get shot. Several were killed and many left Florida altogether. Cuba was a 45-minute flight from Miami. And for years, at least since Batista took over in 1933, Havana was a place where rich Americans went on vacation. Although gambling was legal, Cuban casinos had a bad reputation for cheating. The country's military had control of gambling, but Batista wasn't seeing the profits he wanted. Maya had been going to Cuba for years, and Batista sought his help. He asked Maya to take over the Grand Casino Nacional. Maya brought his own dealers down to work the casino and hired an old-time New York gangster with a lot of respect to be the front man. Maya fell in love with Cuba. He was running a legit casino and didn't have to worry about the law, greasing palms, or envious gangsters. Back in L.A., Ben was overseeing the mob's interest in the Golden State. That included bookmaking, gambling, and the racing wire, which allowed race results to be wired from around the country so bettors could bet off track. One of his books was run by a man named Morris Orloff. One night, some men busted in with guns drawn. It took Orloff's ring and 23 grand. Orloff reported to Jack Dragner, and Jack Dragner let Ben know. The robber was recognized as Mickey Cohen, a young, tough Jewish hoodlum. Originally born in Brownsville, Brooklyn, his family moved to Ohio and he grew up in Cleveland, where he started his criminal career. After some time in Chicago, Mickey was sent to L.A. by the Chicago outfit and he was told to check in with Ben when he got there. Mickey didn't check in with anybody. He put together a crew and started stealing everything they could. Mickey was sent for. He was told to meet Siegel at the Hollywood YMCA. He was told to refer to him as Mr. Siegel and to stand at attention. Ben got right to it. He said that was a nice piece of work. But I want you to do me a favor. Kick back the 23 grand in the ring. Mickey told him he wouldn't kick back to his mother. Ben stood puzzled. Then he looked coldly at Mickey and said, You heard what I said. Mickey said, Go screw yourself and strut it off. The next day, Mickey was picked up by the cops and held for eight days. When he was released, he was ordered to a lawyer's office. When he got there, he saw Johnny Roselli and Ben Siegel. Ben told him that the money was syndicate money and he had to return it. Mickey caved in. He gave the money back, and Mickey became Ben's muscle on the coast. Ben 
who learned on the Lepke, so to say, saw an opportunity to use the many unions in Hollywood to get the movie studios by the short hairs. He took control of the movie Extra Union. Then would go to big wigs like Louis B. Mayer of MGM and Jack Warner of Warner Brothers. He would say, hey, Louis, how much can I put you down for? For what, they would ask. For the Extra Union. They would try to act dumb and say, I'm not giving anything. Ben would say, I don't think you understand. Without extras, you got no movie, and we control the unions. So again, how much can I put you down for? Sometime in the mid-40s, Ben came to his old pal, George Raft, and said, I need 20 grand. Who does it, replied George. Ben said, Tony Cornero has a million-dollar idea, and I want in. George said, you know I'd love to help you, but I don't have that kind of money right now. But you can get it, right? Then get it, said Ben. Okay, pal, I'll try, said Raph. Tony Cornero was a former bootlegger. His ships had nothing to ship. So he decided to turn the ships into gambling ships that would operate three miles off the Santa Monica coast. He was looking for investors in his new venture, a luxury casino named the Rex. George went to one of the producers at the studio and borrowed money against his next film and got Ben the cash. Cornero put together half a million and launched the Rex. The ship was promptly raided by the L.A. Sheriff's Department. Undeterred, Cornero then moved 12 miles off the coast into international waters. Rich people paid through the nose to take the choppy ride out to the wrecks just to lose their shirts. The ship was a cash cow, and soon Cornero launched several other ships. But George had not received any dough back from his loan to Ben. Ben was avoiding his old pal, and George resorted to writing a letter to Ben. Dear Ben, between the federal government, studios, and several other personal transactions, I've really been hard pressed for cash. I will surely greatly appreciate whatever you can possibly afford to spare me. And I honestly trust that you fully understand this request. Again, I'd like to remind you, Ben, that if my finances weren't as bad as they actually are, under no circumstances would I ever ask you. Your friend and pal, George. A few days later, George was driving through Hollywood. Ben pulled up behind him and signaled for him to pull over. George pulled over and Ben got out, walked up to George's car and gave him a check for two grand. George said, what's this for? Ben said, I wanted to pay you back. I'll get the rest of you as soon as possible. Ben would end up giving George $500 a week until the debt was paid off. Cornero would continue to run his ships until the state's attorney shut him down. February 10th, 1948, he was walking to his home when shots rang out. An unknown shooter shot once. The bullet tore through the gambling czar's belly, taking a part of a small intestine with him. He would survive. On July 31st, 1955, Tony Canero was shooting craps at his casino in Las Vegas, the Stardust. He blew on the dice, shook him, and rolled snake eyes, and instantly dropped dead of a heart attack. One of Ben's missions on the West Coast was to set up a new drug pipeline through Mexico. The Second World War had made getting opium across the Atlantic difficult and nearly impossible. But the poppy plant also grew in Mexico. Ben would buy raw opium and have it shipped to Tijuana to be processed and smuggled into California. Even though J. Edgar Hoover's stance on the mob was that it didn't exist, the FBI kept an extensive file on Ben and his narcotic business, as did the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. One night, George Raff went to Romanoff's restaurant off Wilshire Boulevard. He was seated at his usual booth, and after a few minutes, he noticed the old pal from New York. George walked over and said, Hello, Joe. Joe was Giuseppe Dodo, better known as Joe Adonis. After pleasantries, Joe said, George, I'd like you to meet Virginia Hill. Only Virginia Hill was born in Lipscomb, Alabama on August 26, 1916, one of ten children born to Mac and Margaret Hill. She grew up fast and was already sexually active by the age of 12. Sometime in the teens, she made her way to Marietta, Georgia. By 1933, at the age of 17, she was in Chicago. Virginia was a 5'4 beauty with gray eyes and legs that never stopped. It was the time of the World's Fair in Chicago, and Virginia got a job on the fairgrounds. But Virginia was not above using what she had to get what she wanted. So soon she became a striptease dancer. She came in contact with lots of gangsters and was noticed by Joe Epstein, a bookie under the outfit umbrella. Soon Epstein was supporting the feisty, foul-mouthed beauty. Virginia lived a gangster's girl life. Wake up, go shopping, go out to expensive restaurants, party all night, come home, screw, go to sleep, wake up, and do it again. When Virginia went home to visit her family, she came in style. Brand new convertible, silk dress, and neck, fingers, and wrists shimmering with gems. When she went back to Chicago, she took her little brother Chick with her. Chick and Virginia became inseparable. Wherever she went, he went. 
1938, Virginia and Chick moved to L.A. to start a new life in Hollywood. In 1939, Virginia and Chick returned home to Louisiana. While home, she got married to Leon Ozzie Griffin. Virginia would say that he was an All-American football player at the University of Alabama. But really, he was the son of a lumberyard owner. The marriage only lasted seven days before the pair had it annulled. Virginia and her brother went back and forth between Mexico, Chicago, and L.A., and you can guess what she had in her bags. Virginia had suitors all over the country and Mexico. She had her fun with all of them, but nothing was serious. In 1943, Virginia made her way to the Big Apple. She got a place off Broadway and soon started rubbing shoulders and other parts with some of the biggest gangsters in the city. One of those was Joe Adonis. One night, she was having drinks with Joe, and Ben walked in. Joe introduced her to Ben. Ben sat down, and Joe began to feel uneasy. Even he could feel the tension between the two. He finished his drink and said goodbye and left with Virginia. Soon rumors started circulating that Ben took Joey's girl. Ben would make her his official mistress, and she went back to L.A. with him. Ben promised to get her into the movies, and she did some screen tests and some glamour photos, but nothing ever came of it. Ben was sweet on Virginia, and even sat down and penned her a love letter that she would keep until the end. The Countess noticed that Ben was not spending time with her. Her relationship with Ben ended one night when Virginia threatened to claw her eyes out when they crossed paths at a party. Ben was technically still married to Esther. He put on the appearance of being a good father and a loving husband. He built a mansion in Beverly Hills and moved the family out to L.A. But when the sun went down, Ben would go see Virginia. Ben and Virginia had the fiery type of relationship you only get when two highly dysfunctional people fall in love. Passionate sex, followed by equally passionate arguments that turned physical, ending in even more passionate sex. Virginia was staying in an apartment with Chick. When Ben came by, she would give Chick a C-note and tell him to beat it. Ben and Virginia's relationship was no secret. And by 1945, Ben and Esther were divorced. And according to Virginia, her and Ben went to Mexico and got married. She never took her ring off, and it was one of her prized possessions until she died. That same year, Maya got divorced from Anna and he was splitting his time between Miami and Cuba. January of 1946, Charlie Lucky was released from prison and deported back to Italy. Meyer and Ben both attended a send-off. It was a big affair. Charlie spent a few hours with his old pals eating and drinking and laughing. The ship departed, and he retired in Italy. So they thought. For years, the mafia had been importing illegal immigrants from Italy. In fact, that was one of Salvatore Maranzano's big money makers before he got clipped. Charlie used this network to smuggle himself into Cuba. With Maya's connections with the Cuban government, Charlie came in undocumented. The plan was to stay in Cuba and run the mob from there. In December, a conference was held in Cuba at the Hotel Nacional de Cuba. The bosses of the U.S. gathered to hash out the next phase of organized crime. That included tightening the grip they had on the unions, like the Teamsters, the biggest trucking union in the U.S., setting up a new pipeline for dope from Turkey through Marseille and into America. And there were also talks about using the mob's expertise and making plush gambling houses to build legal casinos in Las Vegas. In 1931, the state of Nevada legalized gambling. During the 30s, small casinos popped up throughout the state. Most of these were Western-themed sawdust joints. By the 40s, Reno was the gambling capital of Nevada. But these hole-in-the-wall joints were not pulling in the high rollers. Their main clientele were the local people who came out to gamble on the weekends. There was no draw for the big fish in L.A. As the legend goes, Ben went out to Vegas and saw a vision in the desert. A vision of the biggest, most extravagant hotel casino in the world. After all, if Meyer and Frank Costello can do it, so could he. Ben bought a 30-acre piece of land seven miles from the center of town. He would name his casino the Flamingo, supposedly after Virginia. Now, there are a lot of stories about how she got that name, but that's what Ben called it. At that time, Las Vegas was a dusty town with no more than 10,000 residents, and Native Americans still walked the streets dressed in traditional garb. Ben decided to sell shares for $250 each. He went to his underworld pals with a plan. Ben got himself 195 shares, Meyer purchased 100. Costello purchased 22.5 through his representative, Morris Rosen. Former Bug and Meyer member, Lewis Park Rose got 175. Ben's pal, Alan Smiley, got 15. Former bootlegger Sam Rothberg got 95. Joe Ross, Siegel's attorney, got 45. Hyman Abrams purchased 22.5. Sally Soloway, Siegel's brother-in-law, got 20. Billy Wickerson, a reporter, took 125. Alan A. Block took 10. And Charles L. Strauss took 100 shares. The total came to about a million dollars, and Ben got started. 
and used his union pool and bought lumber, cement, and piping directly from the Hollywood lots. He brought marble from Mexico and used his underworld connections to get metals still under war restrictions off the black market. From the beginning, Ben was in over his head. He paid too much for everything. He shipped carpenters, plumbers, and plasters from other states and paid them 50 bucks a day. He paid 25 grand to have a beam removed from his private suite. Ben had designed the room himself, but there was a beam in the ceiling that was only five foot eight off of the ground. Ben would have to duck every time he crossed the room. He exploded and demanded it be fixed. In December 1945, Virginia moved into Ben's suite. Chick got another room in another hotel and a job working at the Flamingo. Soon the costs were going through the roof and Ben had to get more loans. He planned on opening the hotel on Christmas of 1946. He ran into another problem when all the stars he asked to come down for the opening denied him. He called George Raft and asked, what gives? George told him that William Randolph Hearst sent down the word that everyone should stay away from Ben. On December 26, 1946, the Flamingo had his opening night. To say it was a disaster would be putting it light. The turnout was very light. One reason was a big winter storm that kept the planes he chartered on the ground on the tarmac in L.A. The headliner Jimmy Durante showed up, and Ben's pal George Raff drove his own car there. The staterooms were not complete yet, so other hotels in the area made more money than he did. Even the house always win rules didn't apply. His competitors came to the opening and won big at the tables. So did Gus Greenbaum, a gangster Ben and Porter from Arizona to help him. Ben and Gus never saw eye to eye and would eventually have a falling out over Virginia's behavior. He took the Flamingo for thousands that night. The only big loser was Ben's pal, George Raff, who lost $65,000. Ben was losing his mind. He changed dice, rotated dealers, but nothing worked. Even some of the dealers he hired were conspiring to work against him. Chick noticed one dealer working with a partner to cheat. Chick told Ben. Ben told him to get the pit boss. The pit boss grabbed the dealer and Ben kicked his partner in the back, knocking him to the ground, sending cars and chips flying. He scrambled to his feet and ran out the door. After only two weeks, the Flamingo was in the red for 300 grand. Ben shut it down until he could get all the construction done and the hotel rooms finished. After another one of their arguments, Virginia tried to overdose with sleeping pills. Chick and Ben rushed her to the hospital where her stomach was pumped. When she got out of the hospital, she returned to her new mansion in Beverly Hills on Linden Drive. The cost of the Flamingo had inflated to $3 million. Ben borrowed more money from his underworld pals to get the construction finished. Ben reopened the Flamingo in the spring of 1947, and after a while it began to show profit, but it wasn't enough. Ben was in the hole, and all of L.A. knew it. The Countess came to visit Ben in Vegas and offered him 50 grand. Even though he needed it, he declined to offer. Soon the word was going around that Ben was on the spot. But Ben wasn't worried. He didn't carry a gun unless business called for it. But he had muscle around him. Jaime Siegel, Dave Berman, Fat Irish Green, and his pal George Smiley, the man who put the stiletto in the nose of a band leader to get Frank Sinatra out of his contract. In the spring of 1947, Maya visited the Flamingo to meet with Ben. The next week, Ben called all the big bookies from L.A., Nevada, and Arizona and announced that he was doubling the price of the National Wire Service. In June of 1947, Ben and Virginia had their last fight after she told them she was going to Europe for vacation. The fight left Ben bloody from scratches and a shoe heel Virginia used as a weapon. She stormed out and told her brother to go back to the London mansion. On June 19, 1947, two hard-faced men walked into the Flamingo and asked the bellhop where they could find Ben. He refused to answer, so one of them pulled a gun and threatened to smack him across the head if he didn't start talking. He said that Ben usually came in in the afternoon. Ben was notified, and he called his muscle to the Flamingo. All through the day, Ben received long-distance phone calls. When he answered, a voice would say, Bugsy, you've had it, before hanging up. Ben called Chick in L.A. and told him he was coming to get his things out of Virginia's mansion. Then he called Fat Irish Green into his office and gave him a briefcase with 60 grand in it. He told him to hang on to it. If anything happened to him, some people will come by to get it. Ben went back to L.A., made some rounds and visited some people. One of those people was Mickey Cohen. He asked Mickey if he had any heavy machinery. Mickey's reply was yes. Ben said, okay, I'm going to need you. Later at Virginia's home, Ben received a phone call. Chick would later say that he overheard Ben say, over my dead body you will. You don't have the guts before slamming the receiver. When Chick asked him who was that, Ben said, 
someone who thinks they could take me. Anyone I know? Yeah, you know him, but it doesn't matter. He ain't got the balls to take me. On the night of June 20th, 1947, Ben went to dinner with Alice Molly, Chick Hill, and his girlfriend Jerry. At dinner, he was given a note by the waiter, and it just read, sleep well. When they got back to the mansion, Chick and Jerry went upstairs. Ben and Alan Smiley sat on the couch. Ben was reading the late edition of the LA Times. Outside, an Oldsmobile pulled up in front. A man got out and silently crept up the neighbor's driveway. He was carrying a 30 odd carbine with the spring clip, making it a fully automatic weapon. The hard-faced man snuck behind a fence that bordered the properties. He rested the rifle on the fence, took aim, and shots rang out. Nine bullets flew out of the gun in less than a second. The first struck Ben in the right side of his head, sending one of his baby blue eyes flying across the room. His eyelash would later be found on a door jam. The second passed through his neck. His head fell on his chest and a newspaper slipped into his lap. The other seven shots went wild, one ripping through Alan Smiley's sleeve and the other embedding themselves in the wall. The neighbors were awakened by the shots and saw a man running down the driveway to a car that pulled off when he jumped in. 20 minutes after bullets ended Ben's reign, Mo Sedway and Gus Greenbaum walked into the Flamingo and announced that they were taking over. The murder of Benjamin Siegel was never solved. Everyone from Frankie Carbo, Mexican drug competitors, people mad about the wire service, even Alan Smiley and Chick Hill were suspected. But no one knows. So I'm going to let you guys let me know who you think it was in the comments. When Virginia heard about Ben in Paris, she again tried to overdose on sleeping pills. She was rushed to the hospital and her life was saved again. Only a handful of people came to Ben's funeral, including Esther and the girls, and some of his family. None of his underworld pals came to say their goodbyes. Ben was placed in a crypt at Beth Allum Cemetery, Hollywood Memorial Cemetery in Hollywood. In 1949, Maya took a trip to Europe with his new bride, Teddy. Maya had met Teddy not long after his divorce from Anna in Miami. He told the press that he was going on vacation, but he made some time to visit his old pal, Charlie Lucky, in Naples. In the late 50s, Maya invested most of his money into the construction of the Riviera Hotel in Havana. This would be his legacy. And he went all out to make this the best hotel casino in the world. It would be 21 stories, 440 rooms with a pool and a casino shaped like an egg. He brought in Mo Dallas from Cleveland, Santo Traficante from Tampa, and Ben's old pal, George Raff. President Batista had regained power and passed a law that would give tax breaks to casino builders. By 1958, the casino business was booming in Havana. The Riviera was the first hotel in Cuba with central air. All the beautiful rooms had vents blown cool air. Maya took a job as the kitchen director. The place was classy and it was a strict dress code. The Riviera opened December 10, 1957. Part of the show in the main room was broadcast on Florida TV. Ginger Rogers was the headliner. From day one, the Riviera made money and all the rooms were booked through the winter. Not only was the place known for a fair game, but the food and entertainment were top notch. Everyone was doing well, except for the people in Cuba. So when Fidel Castro and his army rebels were in the mountains, he let it be known that they would run the American gangsters out of the country. Batista still controlled the army, but he thought it would be better to leave, so that's what he did. Batista left Cuba with all his money, leaving Maya hanging. Maya left Cuba within hours of Castro's men seizing control. The Cuban revolution nearly broke Maya. He had invested most of his money and now was gone. Castro had seized the hotels and put them under the state. Maya moved back to Miami with Teddy and tried to reestablish himself. He still had his shares in Vegas and invested in more casinos. Maya was brought before the McClellan hearings. He was asked about Ben and Vegas, but he had nothing to say that will help him. In the 60s, Maya began to be hounded by the IRS. They said he owed a lot of money. He had only paid taxes on the $6,000 he claimed he earned in 1958 from his restaurant supervisor job. On March 24th, 1966, the lifeless body of Virginia Hill was found in Kopi, Austria. It appears she finally succeeded in overdosing on sleeping pills. There will be a lot of speculation about Virginia's death, but in the end, it was ruled self-inflicted. To get away from the hounds at the IRS and the government who wanted them on gambling charges, Meyer decided in July of 1970 to move to Israel, as was his right as a Jew. While he waited for his citizenship to be approved, him and Teddy stayed in Tel Aviv, and the elderly gangster would be seen walking his dog, Bruiser, along the shores of the Mediterranean. Maya felt in his heart that he would be admitted to Israel, but the U.S. government put pressure on the Israeli government to send him back to the States. Even Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir was on his side at first, until she was briefed on his case and the word mafia came up. 
Even though she couldn't speak English, she understood mafia. She said, mafia, no mafia in Israel. The Israeli Supreme Court denied his appeal and he was expelled from Israel. Maya left, but he didn't go right home. He stopped in many South American countries seeking asylum, offering a million dollars to any country that would give it to him. All these countries were pressured by the State Department to send him away. Maya finally came home to Miami in November 1972. When his plane landed, he was arrested by FBI agents and charged with tax evasion and being part of a money skimming operation in Las Vegas from 1960 to 1967. But before he saw a trial, Maya suffered a heart attack and had to be hospitalized. His doctors claimed that he was not able to appear in court. But his trial started in January 1973. Maya pled not guilty to tax evasion and was released on $650,000 bond. In March of 73, he was found guilty of willfully evading a subpoena from 1971. On March 17, 1973, Meyer underwent open heart surgery and his tax evasion trial was postponed until July. In June, he was sentenced to one year and a day in jail for contempt on the subpoena conviction. His trial on tax evasion was put on hold, as was the skimming case. His doctors claimed that he was too ill to stand trial. By August of 74, even the Nevada judge doubted that Meyer would ever stand trial. He said the case would lie dormant on the docket until Meyer died or the state did the right thing and dropped the charges. Meyer would never serve the one-year sentence. On December 6, 1974, a court of appeal ruled that the government had not proven Lansky willingly did not comply with a subpoena that was issued while he was in Israel. Meyer would be in and out of the hospital over the next few years, never well enough to stand trial. On January 15, 1983, Lansky died of heart failure in his home in Miami. Everyone assumed that the old mobster had millions stashed somewhere, but Meyer left very little in his estate. It was not even enough to make sure that his disabled son Buddy was taken care of. He spent his remaining days being cared for by the state. And that, my friends, is the skinny on Bug and Meyer Gang. I'm sorry it took so long, but I really wanted to do this right. I, I remember I used to look for information on the Bug and Meyer Gang, hoping someone would do a video, so I had to be the one to put it out myself. So I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. I hope you learned some things that you didn't know about these guys. Uh, I want you to stay tuned. we got a lot of stories coming out this year. I'm going to be bouncing around the country a little bit, and I'll be telling you some stories about some guys you didn't know you wanted to know about. All right? So make sure you hit that notification so you don't miss nothing. And you know the rest. Bump off that subscribe button. Break that thumb. And if you want to slide a little envelope upstairs to the boss to help the channel run smooth, the link is down below. And if you want the uncut versions, the versions of the videos that I can't show you on YouTube, you got to subscribe to the Few Bad Men Patreon channel. All right? So, this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies. <laughs>